Well, Bob, thanks so much for coming. I appreciate it. Have you ever seen the uh, oral history done of your dad? It, it's located in the Truman Library? I have one oral history that was done on a television. I don't think I've actually seen the oral history of the official one. Mm -hmm. There's one where he was more like an interview where he went through a lot, and I do have a tape, a tape of that. Mm -hmm. Did he talk about Farben at all? Do you remember in that? He talked about Farben. He was more concerned in that, though, with the fact that the world would forget the Holocaust mm -hmm. and deny that it ever happened. Right. That in his later years was what he was really concerned about and that we'd be destined to repeat it. And if you look at the world today, we're repeating it, but you know, not on that scale, but so. Well, your, your dad and you, I know, have uh, received a variety of, of awards from Jewish organizations for work that he did during the war. Uh, for the camera, what is it that your dad did which would have caused so many Jewish groups to pause, reflect, and to uh, kind of put him on a, on a pedestal. Well, during the war, the State Department was very anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. And Dad was with the Treasury Department. And they were trying to get some of the Jews. Hitler had actually said that anyone who would accept the Jews, Hitler would send them over. But no country was willing to accept them. Uh, he wrote a letter, which was get presented to Roosevelt by the Secretary of Treasury, that basically said what the State Department was doing. At the time, he was a friend of Drew Pearson and threatened Roosevelt with if he didn't get action, he would turn the letter over to Drew Pearson. Was that right? And based upon that, they did allow some Jews to enter the United States. But it was really because that was what he got the awards for. <clears throat> well, little I, I, I know of it, and I was just reading a little bit about it now, that. Uh, he was in a position to see uh, information that was given from the uh, Germans to the English where the Germans were willing to basically exchange or have various Jews leave Germany to go to England. And England was, was sort of balking on that, wasn't they? This my understanding. England was balking on it. The United States was balking on it. Uh, most countries who were in the Allies were balking on accepting the Jews and Hitler at one point in time, from my understanding, said he would turn them all over if they wanted them. Yeah. Uh, let me get rid of them. But uh, the countries balked at accepting them in, within the borders. What your dad say about the, uh, the? Obviously, there was a governmental pushback uh, of his memorandum, and obviously, not all of that which was offered uh, occurred. What was his feeling at the time? Did, did he explain to you his kind of disgust or angst? No, actually at the time I was seven, or no, I was only four years old at the time, yeah. so he didn't do a lot of explanation yeah. uh, about what was going Later on. Later in life, did he? Later in life, if you asked him about it, he would tell you that he only did what anyone should do. Mm -hmm. And that would be the extent of the comment you would get. Um, Finally, he did accept some rewards. He accepted the Righteous Gentile Award, which was nice because it was the last time my father's family, brothers and sisters, got together right. before they <laughs> now you're kidding me, before they passed away. Yeah, yeah. My uncle Louis started then dad. So, but you should. You, there's pretty extensive conversation here in this uh, interview uh, of your dad. And he was a Josiah Dubois Jr. Uh, what did Josiah Dubois Sr. do? What was he was a uh, owned a lumber yard. He was a realtor, invested in real estate. Uh, I guess that was about it. And 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 they they settled in the uh, New Jersey area. Was that? It was in Woodbury, New Jersey, and they also had a home in Ocean City, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, investments in real estate. Included most of what's now the garden section of Ocean City, but unfortunately, when the Depression came along, the bank owned more of it than he did. So uh, he did have a house down there. They kept they kept the drugstore because they could make some money with that. They let the house go, and the bank let him buy the house back after the Depression. University of Penn Law School, uh, and then it really started after that. 
did he did he spend much time explaining to you in later life his uh, how his public career got started? He went to work for the Treasury Department, mm -hmm. and he stayed with the Treasury Department during the war. And after the war, he went and opened a law office with my uncles, Herb and Matt. They had a law office in Camden. Uh, then he was contacted again to see about when he became prosecutor for the deputy chief prosecutor for the IG Farman trials. And then he was over to Germany for, I think it was three years, could may have been a little longer. Uh, I was over for one year of that. My mother was over for about a year and a half. And what do you recall of that? As a young, you would have been six, seven years old? I had my eighth birthday in Germany. Did you? Yes. Uh, I remember the house. Uh, we had a house that, of course, the you know, we had commandeered from the Germans, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it was a nice house. And kids in the neighborhood, we could play with them. They only spoke German. I only spoke English. So, but we managed to get along. And yeah, I can remember mostly the castles is what I liked. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a uh, chauffeur and a cook. And I don't remember much about anything that's terribly interesting. But well, that's part of the life and times of yeah. Nuremberg, Germany. At the yeah. That was uh, there were no Nazis over there. If anybody ever said anything about Nazis, they, they didn't even know there was such a thing. thing. <laughs> yeah, and that's always the story. They're all ski instructors. Uh, <laughs> do, do you have any re recollection of the normal routine with your dad? Did you spend much time with your dad while you were there? Did... We spent some time. We did take some trips. Yeah, my dad was kind of a workaholic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he went. You know, of course, to the trials during the morning, and then at night he would work on whatever he was getting ready for the next day. So this was kind of how he did his life, and you know, he he worked on it a lot. We did take some, take some trips, and you know, I can't remember exactly where we saw a lot of the castles over there that I thought were neat. Right. Uh, we spent an Easter. I can't think of the name of the town. I remember going over there with the Freedmans, and we had an Easter egg hunt in the woods. Mm -hmm. along with a bunch of bombed out cars. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Germany still wasn't restored at the time. But right. We went through one town over there, which had been one of Hitler's favorites. I don't remember the name of it. And people were actually living under where one building had been bombed and its wall fell on the next one. And people were actually living under there. It was it Berchtesgarten? It, yeah, I think it was Berkta's garden, <laughs> not you mentioned it. You know, they, the they, name rings the bell. <laughs> they, they did a number on his house. They did, sure. they did a number on that whole town. And, and, and there with, with all of the, um, uh, you know, I got the German, American. Do you, do you get a sense from your mother? What, was she, she uh, glad to be there, unhappy? Did you get a sense of her mood while stuck in Germany? I was never particularly happy to be in Germany, and I don't really remember my mother having a comment one way or the other, probably because I mumbled about it and it wasn't my cup of tea, but so she probably would have kept anything that her personal feelings away from me if she didn't want to be there other than that. But, you know, she would have missed my father if she wasn't there, so I don't know that she was that upset about being there. But you left earlier, though, right? Well, she came over, she went over a uh, half a year before we did. Okay. And then she came back and we took a ship over. And during the trip over, the ship went through, was converted, had been a passenger ship, then it was a troop carrier, and then went back to taking, you know, passengers, but it wasn't totally converted back. And on the way back, we, or on the way over, we went through the tail end of a hurricane. Oh and so I was one of the few people on board that wasn't sick, and she said she was never going to take a <laughs> trip across the Atlantic again, so they managed to fly back. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would have been quite an experience. Now, now in your family, are there other, other siblings? Uh, I had a sister. Sister? Yeah, she's no longer with us. Okay. But so both of you would have been in... in, in we both went over, yeah. It was, uh, both of us went over, and I said we spent a year over there, and then... We came back, and my father was over probably for another year before he came back. And just to sort of continue the biography here of your dad, when he came back from Germany and concluded the IG Farben trial, 
then what was the next? He went back into the law office with his brothers, mm -hmm. both Herb and Matt, and he had a uh, law office in Camden, and he continued there for the rest of his life. Your dad, in this interview here, talks about that his introduction to Nuremberg was through an invitation from Telford Taylor, but uh, through the encouragement of a Bell Mayor Zeck. Was that somebody that was, did you get to know her at all? I met Bell Mayor on a few occasions. Uh, she's not one of the ones I really remember, but I did meet her. She was one of the ones we have a house in Ocean City, and once a year, the Nuremberg group would meet in the house in Ocean City, mm -hmm. uh, some of which I remember better than others. Uh, I remember Bell Mayor very vaguely, and can't remember ever forming an opinion one way or the other on her. Some of the other ones. We knew much better. Name names. Who are some of the ones you remember? Uh, Duke Minskoff would probably be one of the primary ones. And what was his role? Was he a, a prosecutor? I don't remember exactly what Duke did. Duke stayed with the Treasury Department later. Duke was was quite a character. Uh, Duke had been diagnosed with skin cancer, told he had six months to live, and 12 years later he went to our wedding. So, <laughs> but uh, he was quite a quite a character. He, we met him. One time we were down in Florida, and Duke was down there, and he managed to get an okay for us to rent a car, and I ended up with a date, and he got a date for the other guys who were down. So yeah, Duke was quite an operator, and Drex Sprecher, and he and my father remained friends uh, for the entire their entire life. Uh, mm -hmm. They uh, they came on, and uh, Charlie Lyons, he was quite a clown. Mm -hmm. They used to play bridge one time, and my wife, he looked at the guy's partner's hands, the guy next to him's hand so often, my wife thought that was part of the game. <laughs> so, he picked up one time, they were sitting at a dinner table, and they had a cream pie. And he said to Rag, uh, Ragland, he says, Ever see uh, the movies where they threw, throw pie at the guy? He says, yep, that only happens in the movie. Picked it up and threw the pie right in his face. No. In which case, Raglan picked up my tricycle and chased him around the yard with it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Raglan, now, he was a prosecutor, wasn't he? Yeah, I believe he was, yeah. yeah. yeah so. I've heard that name as well. Anybody else in that kind of world of Nuremberg, Ocean City guys? Uh, there probably was, and I can't think of them at the moment. Oh, Bobby Hardy, yeah. Was he in there? Yeah, he was, but I can't, you know, it's another one. It's, I, you know, really wasn't there all the time when they did that. And, yeah. You know, some of them just stick out in your mind better than others. Yeah. Probably because they were a little nutser than the others, but <laughs> <laughs> I put a human, a human side to them anyway. Exactly. Does the name Bernie Bernstein? Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, what, what, now, what was his role in your dad's life and what was the relationship? You know, I don't really remember. Yeah. I remember meeting Bernie Bernstein a few times, as a matter of fact, but he, you know, I just, uh, people come and go. I suffer, I suffer from CRS disease every once in a while. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that we don't have to explain. Okay. <laughs> uh, Colonel Bernstein, yeah, and he, your dad talks about him quite a bit, and, and including a time in Casablanca when they were, uh, uh, during the during the war, they were there. Uh, they're part of their uh, war refugee stuff. And your dad walks out on a porch, and all of a sudden, the Germans strafe the area. And you know, Bernie's out there. Saying, what are you doing? Are you nuts? Get on here! You know. Mm -hmm. and it's just, it's, I never figured what they needed a lawyer on the front lines for to start off with. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, usually they're a fair game. Uh, on the Farben trial. Did, did your dad, he obviously was part of writing, wrote a book. Uh, did he talk to you about that during the process of just gathering up his thoughts, reflection? Did he say, Bob, you know, here's, here's some thoughts, or did he have you critique the book? Or No, he had a ghostwriter, Ed Johnson, mm -hmm. that helped him with the book. And you know, he was writing the book, and to be honest with you, at that time, I wasn't all that interested in the book, so. And he never really mentioned it much. That was, 
And I still wasn't all that old. I guess I was 12, 13 when he was writing the book. Mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I didn't really get that into it and just didn't read the book till after it was done, but he didn't really discuss it much. And he never discussed either I.G. Farben or any of the other things much really around the house. And, and I, as things were going along and, and you heard you get, get, getting these awards and your dad getting these awards and you probably tagging along to a few of them uh, and listening to his speeches and stuff, did you learn a lot from those uh, presentations that you probably didn't know because it's father, son, probably not talking a lot about stuff. It wasn't until he started getting the awards that I even knew what he did as far as the letter, mm -hmm. uh, as far as the report <coughs> and the acquisition. Um, he never talked about it, and then if you did mention it later, he would just say, well, that's what you should do. And that, that would be the extent of what he'd tell you about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he believed that. That's the way he lived his life. So, And I think if it hadn't been in his later years when they started giving him the rewards, he probably would have even turned down going for them. But right, right. in the later years, he started to appreciate you know, getting those. Uh, Dick Goodwin probably talked him into it a lot, too. He and Dick Goodwin were friends. Who's that? Dick Goodwin. He's a builder. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we both did work for Dick. Yeah. And, you know, he was helped set up the uh, Jewish Community Center where they have a Holocaust in Cherry Hill, Holocaust mm -hmm. Museum in Cherry Hill, and Dick was very instrumental in that. So, but I imagine he also helped talk him into going over and getting the rewards. But, but uh, you know, other than that, he, my father never really talked about it when we were growing up. Did you ever talk about Morgenthau, his relationship with, with Henry Morgenthau? Not really. Yeah. Uh, I think they were fairly close, but I never really don't remember him saying ever much about Morgenthau. There, there was a, an article, uh, November 22nd, 2008, The Forgotten Whistleblower Who Saved Jews from Hitler. And uh, uh, he, this is a, a Raphael Medoff. I don't know if you saw this, he did a manuscript that became. It came um, it was called Genocide, Josiah Du Bois Jr. and the Struggle for a U.S. Response to the Holocaust. And have you ever seen that? The book? Yeah. yeah. He gave me a copy. Did he? Did, oh, did he? Yes. <laughs> what did you think of it? I really enjoyed reading it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, again, one of those deals where you probably uh, said, my God, I wish I... <laughs> this... I wish I would gone over more of my father, the history of it, when yeah. he was still alive. But wasn't anything he really, at that time, really wanted to talk about. Um, if I had really asked him, he would have answered the questions. I mean, it wasn't that he really avoided it, it just didn't, wasn't something he wanted to spend a lot of time talking about. Did your mother talk about that at all? Did your mother ever reflect on your dad's career, his work ethic, worth hab work habits? Not really. No? So, no, it's it's a kind of almost what your comments are typical of World War II folks. That just a lot of them, if asked direct pinpoint question, they would give you a direct, short answer. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's mm -hmm. you really would it would be harder to, to peel back the layers and, and get some deep insight. Yeah, into that. I said I really wasn't aware of everything he did. To I'm probably still not aware of everything he did. And and you you've read obviously the 18 page report. And I guess it's entitled, Report to the Secretary on the Acquiescence of This Government in Murder of the Jews. Yes. You know, I visualize this report, you know, he's, a, he's a, in, the, in the government, your, your, your dad's in the government, and you hand that to the secretary. Just reading the title, you gotta, you got to just quake, you know. It was really a gutsy move. Just think of the title of itself, you know. Mm -hmm. That was right. He would proceed with whatever it was. It wasn't. It wasn't the type to really worry about his career, right. per se. If he was right, he was going to do it. Yeah. And if the chips fell against him, they fell against him. Yeah. So you know. Was it because of this that that um, uh, I, I read someplace where the press was when this sort of worked its way out that they uh, were concerned that your dad might be a communist sympathizer? Is, was there any piece of that? 
A, well, for one thing, you always hated Richard Nixon for his work with, uh, you know, the listing of the communist. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know the friend's name, but one of his friends was accused of being a communist and committed suicide. Oh, my gosh. And so he never forgave Nixon for yeah, that. Yeah. I won't say what he used to call Nixon. Yeah. Not if you ever want to show this tape <laughs> in public, but. <laughs> we get a sense. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's been, he was accused of being everything under the sun, uh, from a communist to Jewish to this to that. And so it really wasn't. You know, he clearly, I mean, in, in, on reflections, what a hero, what a brave guy, you know, in many instances along the way. And you must be just kind of proud of him. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he, he was that way all through his life. It wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just in this instance, but everything he did was that way. If your dad were here today and you had to ask a question, um, what's what's the question that you never asked that you wished you had? Don't really know. Yeah. <laughs> so I probably would go more in depth than you know what happened during World War II or what happened in the IG Farben trials. Yeah. Um, you know, he never mentioned much. He always thought that the defendants got off way too light, and but his main worry was that. He would forget what happened in the Holocaust, and we would repeat ourselves. And if you look at the world today, it's a valid concern. Talking about the sentences, I mean, they got off really light, and ultimately, many of them, their uh, uh, clemency. I mean, John McCloy and stuff like that. Did your dad talk about that at all? Did, did any reflection on? They worked so hard to get the convictions and only to have them, the judges, uh, really give them very light sentences. He was disappointed in it, but he still thought it was good that they, you know, had taken them to trial right. to show the world what they did. Um, but he was disappointed in the uh, sentencing. But he never dwelled on it, it was just, uh, you know, comments at various times in later years he made about the sentencing being way too light for what they did. Yeah, yeah. You know, this book that was put out on, on the genocide and references to your dad and it talks about the names of Wallenberg, Oscar Schindler, are familiar to large numbers of Americans, especially to students in states that have mandatory Holocaust education, yet a real genuine American hero of the Holocaust is completely unknown. Josiah Du Bois. I mean, I think that's just such a, 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 a terrific statement. And do you get a sense as, as more people sort of learn more about your dad that that, that will become more and more uh, a name of... Uh, I think there are more people learning about it. There's doing it more opportunity. You know, there's, you know, I usually turn it down, but there's, you have opportunities they want to come in and speak about it. To be honest with you, I don't really know all that much about it anyway, so... Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think history will, will carry his name through it. Yeah. I, I think it's just a remarkable story. And uh, there's a, a real, I'm thrilled here at the Jackson Center that, Bob, you pause and reflect on it. And you brought the whole family in to check this out. Because obviously there's, to us here, this is the kind of story and connect that uh, it does make a difference. I mean, and, and I, I, I bet you probably have a, the question that I haven't asked, because there's always the best question is the one where you'd say, what should I have asked you that I didn't ask you? <laughs> oh, gosh. No, no. <laughs> she let me off easy today. <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, if you went on and talked more and more, something would probably come out. But, um, you know, I can't really think of a question that... Yeah. Is there anything about your, your father-in-law that uh, was unique? He, he was pretty much like Bob said, you know, he, he didn't ever really want to talk about it. Right. Um, he just said, you know, I just did what any one any dis decent person would have done. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, you know, he was very ready to turn in or turn public. Um, the names of those people who did nothing, like he was ready to, you know, denounce Roosevelt, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people who just wouldn't take any action. And he had all kinds of possible ways to bring those people here 
and you know put them in concentration camps, send them back. That didn't have to be. It didn't have to um, impact us that much, and we couldn't understand why they didn't take action mm -hmm. that way. Well. When you read about this, frankly, and this is relatively new for me, is the fact that there was this offer through the English embassy that worked its way back to the United States of saying, here, you know, we'll be glad uh, to, to remove our problem. Part of the Jewish sol the, the, the solution here is, here, take them. And there was pushback. And you can almost see why England, perhaps, was, we don't, what are we going to do with them? But when that side deal that sort of uh, was connected that your dad made, I, mean, I just think that's remarkable. It's a, there's this English-American diplomatic deal where let's agree, we'll take them, and the side deal is we Americans will, if you can't keep them physically, we will. And of course... Well, we only took a very limited and, number. As it turned out, you know, the actual reality was very small. Oh. Uh, and I think it was anticipated, maybe a couple hundred thousand at some point, but that was, it never happened. And I think that's just a tremendous story. That's these things, these, these boys here will negotiate the, the movie rights for this. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. What's the question you want to ask about Grandpa that you didn't get a chance through your dad? <clears throat> I can't say I have something in mind. Um, you haven't talked about, you know. And We've talked about this in the past, and it's sort of uh, what we've brought up today is, I guess, pretty much all we've uh, we've talked, discussed. And uh, you know, I, I would like to, uh, I would love to hear more, but you know, those people that have that knowledge are in the past now, so it's, uh, unfortunately, that's, that's the reality. Well, I think uh, have something to ask in particular. Certainly from the, the IG Farben trial, there's some guys who've written, including we have a board member who's in the process of doing a lot of research on uh, the Farben trial itself and going into the, meeting the chemists, uh, you know, getting, reading about the chemists, because he's coming take it from a whole chemi the chemis chemistry area, you know, where guys who are really professional chemists, that's what they want to do for life, to do something good for mankind, only to have that whole thing corrupted. The Devil's Chemist. That's right. I mean, precisely as the, as the title said, all of a sudden, what was their, their war life work, all of a sudden politically it got infused, and somehow, some way, it got transferred as you being used against mankind, rather than for mankind, against mankind. And he's really intrigued by all of that. And Doug Necker, so he, he would be right here <laughs> if, he, if he could be here this weekend because he, he really finds, you know, what you're... Dad did the Farben trial, uh, really quite remarkable stuff. I, I totally unrelated to anything, but I always ask that one question. What's a question I never asked? Should have asked. I was uh, in Nuremberg and I was interviewing Rudolf Hess's junior attorney, the only guy alive who was part of the Nuremberg trial. Mm -hmm. So I'm like this, and I'm asking the question. I go, "What's the question I should have asked?" Because we're running out of time. He goes, "Oh." In 1952, he, the German defense attorney for Hess, came to Washington, literally went to the Supreme Court, knocked on the door, went in and saw Jackson. Jackson greeted him, brought him into the study, and they went out and had dinner together at his house in Hickory Hill. And his wife was shocked that here was Rudolf Hess's attorney, all of a sudden came home in the car with Jackson, and they had dinner together and he spent the night with him. Now, Nobody could have possibly ever have gotten that story, ever even thought to ask the story, that question of Rudolf Hess's attorney <laughs> going to Washington and spending and having dinner with Jackson seven years after the fact. Bizarre. So that's always kind of trick <laughs> because you never know what's going to happen. You know? <laughs> what you didn't discuss at all, sort of the, just the, the genius of the man himself, uh, and yeah. his, his uh, graduation at uh, an early age. Yeah. He... And his, his uh, chess playing was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that always uh, I found interesting. Yeah. If, uh, if you want to talk about that. Well, he went to school in Woodbury. Mm -hmm. And during the time he went to school, if you exceeded the first half of the year, you went on to the next grade. Uh, 
as an extent, he was in law school before he was old enough to drive. He was a practicing attorney before he was old enough to drink. <laughs> wow. So, oh, he played chess. He could play six, eight people blindfolded and win most of the games. Wow. So. And then when you did ask about his um, parents and, you know, what kind of people they were, and Bob said that, you know, his father had owned the lumber yard and was in real estate and everything, but they believed in education, mm -hmm. like, more than most families. His grandmother, Bob's grandmother, um, um, his dad's mother, uh, she just, it was, you know, if you didn't, if you got a B, why didn't you get an A? And um, they, they just had to perform. And each, then each one, it was the depression, put the next one through college. Mm -hmm. They kind of put the first one through, but then as they went along, they had, once they were out, they had to um, contribute to the college education right. of the next one. Uh, she was really, really fanatical about getting an education. So they all, they all, um, all went to college. That's terrific and unusual at that time period, just the economics. Yeah, yeah well, she, she really believed in education and she pushed them apparently very greatly. Now, when it came to the grandchildren, she hit it. But she still pushed. <laughs> but she made it fun with the grandchildren. I'm sure it wasn't for the children. They used to have a thing in the Courier Post, which is a paper down there, was a word thing, and you had to pick out what the best word was. Well, she'd have you sit down, and we're down shore, and we'd fill these things out. And, well, why is this word the best one here? And we'd sit there and discuss it. You know, looking back at the time, you thought, oh, this is fun. Yeah, looking yeah. back, she was just making sure you got educated. Right, right. <laughs> with, with, a, with a smile, that's great. With a smile. Yeah. So she learned, she learned how to do it with a smile in later years. That's, that's Which, terrific. from what I hear, wasn't the way when they were younger. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is great. This is great. I'm thrilled you're coming to Chautauqua County, checking up on your boys. Are they doing okay? Oh, yeah. So. He's not going on the record. That's, you can see that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing fine. <laughs> yeah. You notice that? This was a quick short. <laughs> I learned how to give quick short answers from my father. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I've always been accused of. <laughs> you know, you're looking for that long conversation, right? <laughs> my wife does the same thing. Can't you just elaborate? No. <laughs> well, thank you.